thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we will have our next talk in just a couple of minutes uh, with Nate from the EFF. Um, Nate, if you're on the line, uh, feel free to connect and um, share your screen and we'll get everyone going in just a minute. Hey there, Sam and Casey. Yes, I am here. Let me get my screen shared. All right. Good. No question that you never shared. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't. All right. Second. So can you see and hear me? Uh, yes. Excellent. All right, let me, uh, I'll get you up on the stream so we can see your screen. And do you want me to wait until three o'clock sharp or do you want me to just Go when you um, tell me. Let me uh, let me make sure I've got everything go good to go, and then you'll be able to start. Okay. All right. Looks like your screen's up there. Let me make sure that we're unmuted on the stream and we'll be able to, to start. All right, everyone. So uh, without further ado, we're going to jump right into the last talk of uh, track two. Uh, we've got Nate Cardoza here from the EFF. He's going to talk about the law and you. Thank you so much for joining us, Nate. I really appreciate it. This is an important topic for all of us in the community. And yeah, take it away. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, the law and you reducing the cost of free speech. So I'm gonna talk about vulnerability disclosure. This is something that I'm sure all of you who are attending a bug crowd uh, conference know at least something about. A lot of what I'm gonna say is probably obvious and you're gonna say, uh-huh, yeah, right. Uh, we already knew that. Um, but you're gonna say it at different times from each other. So I think it's still worth, I think it's still worth reiterating the obvious and hopefully you'll pick up a, a, a little bit here um, that you wouldn't have before. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna talk about what EFF is, what our Coders Rights Project does, uh, the legal and policy uh, positions that we take as part of the Electronic Frontier Foundation to support Coders Rights, but mostly I'm gonna give you practical advice, um, both in terms of how to conduct research at the outset to make disclosure easier later on, and then once we've uh, decided that disclosure is a route that we're going to go down. I'll give you some do's and don'ts uh, for uh, vulnerability disclosure. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, founded in 1990, is the oldest and biggest NGO defending civil liberties in the digital world. Uh, we do free speech, privacy, and innovation. Uh, our biggest tool is impact litigation. We take people to court to either make the law better or keep it from getting worse. Uh, we also do policy analysis. Um, I've gone up to Capitol Hill to lobby about computer hacking laws. Um, and we do grassroots activism and technology development. Uh, we brought you the world's uh, first and now biggest totally free certificate authority, Let's Encrypt. Uh, and we have a whole floor full of activists whose full-time job is to help you tell the policymakers and people in power uh, what you want them to do, not just what the uh, well-funded corporate types want them to do. As part of that, the Coders' Rights Project has been around uh, for two decades now, um, and it's uh, had a number of lawyers working throughout the years. Currently, it's myself, Nate Cardozo, our general counsel, uh, who's Kurt Opsall, Andrew Crocker, Jamie Williams, and Stephanie LaCombra. Uh, and we help coders, security researchers, developers, hackers, you name it, at all stages of their research. 
We love it when folks come to us and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing some research. How can I do it legally? Uh, we don't love it quite as much when folks come to us and say, here's all this research I did. I know it was extremely illegal. How do I present it without getting in trouble? Um, but we're happy to help people in, in either of those buckets or anywhere in between. Um, and you know, the, the reason that this project is necessary is really unfortunate. Uh, and, and that's that too many legitimate researchers face legal challenges that present, um, that prevent or inhibit their work. Um, this could be visits from your not so friendly local FBI agent uh, to export control regulations, uh, to NDAs, to EULAs, you name it. Vulnerability disclosure. Um, as I'm sure you all know, security research does depend on the free flow of information and the uninhibited exchange of ideas. Uh, and the First Amendment here in the United States gives us a right to disclosure, including proof of concept code. Um, this is pretty, pretty well settled in the law. Um, it's, to, despite the fact that it uh, seems like a pretty uh, uh, absolute statement that the First Amendment protects your right to disclose, it really does. It really does protect the right to disclosure. Um, that said, you can still get in trouble for disclosure, not through the act itself, but more commonly uh, because the, the process of disclosure ends up uh, giving proof to the wrong people that you did the wrong things. And so that's what we're going to try and, and guard against today. Um, code is speech. Uh, so when, when I said on the last slide that uh, that disclosure is, is First Amendment protected activity. That's true even for uh, proof of concept. Um, back in the early uh, 1990s, uh, code was not generally considered free speech. Dan Bernstein, then a grad student at um, University of California at Berkeley, came into our office uh, wanting to publish an encryption algorithm online. He had gone to the uh, State Department, which administered the export regulations and applied for permission, and he was denied. And so we went to court for him. EFF represented Dan Bernstein uh, all the way up to the Ninth Circuit, and we got a really great case, which is now known as the Bernstein case, uh, which really uh, pretty solidly makes it clear that under US constitutional law, code is speech and is fully protected. Um, Article 13 of the uh, American Convention is even stronger. Information and ideas of all kinds uh, through any medium of one's choice. So code is speech, not just in the United States, but in the, in the uh, entirety of the Americas, uh, from uh, Chile and Argentina to Canada and everything in between. The situation in Europe and Australia, a little bit different, but uh, luckily I'm a US lawyer and I, most of you are probably in the United States and most of the companies to whom you're going to be uh, disclosing are probably in the United States. So the goals uh, of the Coders' Rights uh, project are to protect disclosure, pen testing tools, proof of concept code. Um, so that's a, a real practical um, goal of ours. Then the sort of bigger, less practical, more ideological goals are to discourage governments uh, from enacting overly broad anti-hacking laws. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act here in the United States uh, was written in 1986. The way that computers look and operate and the way that the network acts are utterly different today than they were uh, 30 years ago when the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act was passed. And so we want to discourage other countries uh, and other states within the United States from enacting overly broad laws because we've seen what the CFAA has done. Um, and then finally, we, we work to ensure that penalties for computer crimes are in line with similar crimes in the real world. Uh, currently, this is not the case and we're, we're hoping to try and make it more so. Uh, an example here is Matthew Keyes. Matthew Keyes was charged with uh, helping someone else to face a single page on the uh, Los Angeles Times website. It remains defaced for about 45 minutes, uh, and he got 16 months in federal prison for that. That's ridiculous. Practical protections. Um, the, the reason that you don't want to be a test case and you don't want EFF to ever ha have to represent you is because uh, being hauled in front of a judge is 
extremely painful, especially because judges and prosecutors are largely extremely unsophisticated. There are counterexamples here. We saw uh, a judge in San Francisco learn Java uh, to um, rule on the Oracle versus Google copyright case, but he is the exception, let me tell you, not the rule. So what this talk isn't, I'm not going to preach to you about how you should disclose. I'm not going to give you a one-size-fits-all approach, and I'm not going to give you legal advice. I am a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. I will take questions at the end. Uh, I, would, I, will, I would love questions at the end, uh, but I'm not going to give you specific legal advice uh, that's, that's um, specific to your situation. Research. Okay, so let's, let's start at the beginning. You're starting at the beginning. What can you do to be better positioned for disclosure later? Get ahead of the game. If you can do it on your own stuff, on your own equipment, on your own account, on your own network, please do. It is a lot easier to defend security research when they did it on their own stuff. Uh, is the target of your research sitting behind a terms of service or an end user license agreement, a TOS or a EULA? Uh, if it is behind one of those, is there a way you can get it without agreeing to that TOS or EULA? Uh, is it downloadable from somewhere else? Can you buy it used? Uh, if so, that might be a great way of never being bound by the pesky TOS or EULA. Uh, remember at the beginning when I said that disclosure Vulnerability disclosure is First Amendment protected activity. Um, that's absolutely true, but by disclosing a vulnerability that you had to have reverse engineered something that you agreed not to reverse engineer, uh, for instance, in a terms of service or an end user license agreement, you might be incriminating yourself. Um, obviously, look for bug bounty programs. If a bug bounty program exists, uh, read the terms of that program before you start your research, not after. Uh, and then consider the optics of the research. Uh, are you uh, researching you know, voting security in Georgia? You might want to think about the Secretary of State as part of your threat model. Um, are you researching medical devices? You might want to be extremely clear that you did not test this uh, in the real world. Okay, now you've found a vuln. What do you do? Well, it depends. What's your goal? Is your goal merely to get the thing fixed? Uh, is your goal to publish or present about your research or about the vulnerability or about the process of finding the vulnerability? Um, is your intent to get famous? Is your intent to get paid? Uh, all of those will have, um, uh, will, will make your, the process of disclosure different for you. Disclosure do. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some do's and don'ts here. Developers are people too. Uh, computers are machines and software runs on computers, but the people who designed them are still people. And why do I say this? This is obvious. Um, I say this because they're flawed just like the rest of us. Um, maybe their egos are too big. Maybe they're not as good a developer as you are and they're not able to see how your stuff works. Um, but the ego thing I think is, is the biggest to remember. Uh, you found a place where they fucked up. Uh, so what do you do? Don't make them feel bad about it. Many of the problems that security researchers that we in our practice as lawyers uh, have faced could have been avoided if they had taken this to heart. Um, and what do I mean by that? Remember that it may be that the person who's reading your vulnerability report is the person whose fault the vulnerability was in the first place. Don't try and make them feel bad. Um, that's a, a, a good way of sometimes even getting a, uh, a vulnerability report escalated to the lawyers. And that's the, speaking as a lawyer, that's the last thing you want. So remember, do your homework. Do they have a vulnerability submission process? If so, that should be your first step. Um, are they on bug crowd, for instance? What's the company's history? Uh, are we talking a big, sophisticated uh, technology sector company, a, a Google or a, or a Facebook? Um, or are we talking someone who's only recently started to get into tech and might not even think about a vulnerability disclosure program? Uh, a, a good example here, 
um, not from anyone I counseled, but uh, uh, Brinks, the, the safe company. Um, that is a very old company with a very long history of dedication to security and complete novice uh, level cybersecurity skills. And they had no idea uh, what to do with the first vulnerability report um, that they got. Uh, and then Google, just do as much Googling as you can uh, about the company uh, to whom you're about to disclose. Have they sued security researchers before? Uh, if so, tread very carefully, that kind of thing. Find, so, so uh, this slide depends on the answer to the first question on the previous slide being no. Do they have a submission process? If the answer is no, find a person, find a real live human being, uh, someone who developed the product, someone on the team who's responsible for security, uh, someone who with the name security in their job title who will be able to understand what the fuck you're talking about. Um, LinkedIn is your friend here. It is often not that hard. Um, to find an actual human being to whom you can direct a, a vulnerability report. Um, and you gotta, this is sometimes times when, develop, when um, researchers fail to do their homework. Uh, and again, LinkedIn can actually be your friend. I, I feel weird telling people that LinkedIn is a useful and good tool, but in this case, LinkedIn is a useful and good tool. Disclosure do. Uh, first contact will be your most important contact. Uh, so be friendly, come in peace, and do not, uh, don't belittle the company, the developer, the vulnerability, don't oversell, don't undersell, um, but make your intentions clear. Uh, if you've already decided to go down the vulnerability reporting pathway, um, then pr presumably you want to get this thing fixed. You might also want money, you might also want to be able to present, um, but make it clear that your first goal is to get this thing fixed. How important is it? Uh, is this the sort of vulnerability that uh, if published could lead every Tesla in the world uh, to have its brakes applied at the same time, right? Is this a public safety matter or is it simple nuisance? Um, you know, is this a, a vuln that will make a heart implant stop working, or is this a vuln that will make a game console lose an hour of time? Don't oversell or undersell your research. Uh, if you're working alone, maybe talk to someone, uh, talk to a peer, either inside or outside your organization, uh, about it to see if their assessment of the vulnerability matches yours. Disclosure, don't. Do not threaten. If your first language is that of a threat uh, to, to the company, they're going to take it poorly. Um, don't make a demand. Don't make an ultimatum on first contact. Uh, you know, Project Zero at Google can do a hard 90-day deadline for all of their volumes, uh, really only because they're Google and no one in their right mind is going to sue Google. Um, but you're not Google. I mean, unless you are Google, but in which case you don't need my help. Um, so don't tell them on the first contact that unless it's fixed in 90 days, I'm going to go public. Even if that's your plan, don't put it in that first email. Uh, so you have, and if, if, uh, if your first language is different from the language of the developers, be even more careful. Don't demand compensation or a job, even if there's a bug bounty program. Uh, if there is a bug bounty program, certainly mention that in your first communications, but don't open with a demand for cash. Um, offering help is fine, but making your help contingent on anything else could lead to problems. Why am I saying this? You want to uh, avoid extortion charges. You do not want the company to be able to tell a judge with a straight face that they were being threatened by a hacker. Um, we see that happen yeah, with some frequency. Um, also remember the folks who are going to be reading the vulnerability report that you wrote, and maybe even the folk who wrote it, that being you, um, might have social skills that are more comparable to the average developer and less comparable to the average uh, customer support um, representative. We in our field 
are a, a strange and wonderful bunch of people, and I love to interact with hackers, um, but I have a decade of experience doing so, and the people to whom you're going to be reporting might not. Don't offer to keep quiet in exchange for anything, money or otherwise. That is blackmail. Even if it's true, that's not the way you should phrase it. And don't say too much too soon. Uh, for instance, let's say you are doing some, uh, some pen testing and you happen to get into uh, an S3 storage container that had everything of value that the company uh, has ever come up with. It might not be the best idea to tell them immediately the severity of everything you've got. Certainly don't hold it back once they ask, but maybe don't lead with it. Okay, and here's the you might need a lawyer if slide. Uh, DRM. If you had to break DRM to do any part of your research, you probably need to talk to a lawyer. Uh, if you violated a non-disclosure agreement, if you violated a terms of service, if you violated an end user license agreement, uh, you probably need to talk to a lawyer before disclosure. Um, if you gained access to something non-public, uh, I I'd let like if if a client that I was advising gained access to someone something non-public, I would want to talk it through very carefully to avoid admitting to a computer fraud and abuse act uh, violation as part of that disclosure. Um, if you got something from a less than public source, uh, you know, if you found this uh, way out on some Tor hidden service, um, if you got this from uh, an FTP that you know that they didn't intend to be public, something like that. If you got this from a shadowy figure in a darkened hallway in the middle of the night, uh, you probably want to talk to a lawyer. And then the last and, and most common issue in, in my practice as a, uh, as a coder's rights lawyer at EFF is you might need a lawyer if your employer will be upset. Uh, a lot of you work in security and a lot of you have jobs um, that overlap with your own interests. If your employer is, if, 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 if your disclosure is going to make your employer's business or life um, difficult, then talk it through with them first especially if uh, your residency status in the United States depends on your employment. You do not want, um, as, has, as we've seen uh, at DEF CON's past, um, the choice between giving your talk at DEF CON and remaining in the United States. Uh, so let's sort those out before, uh, 20 minutes before your talk in Las Vegas. Note, no one size fits all. Um, I don't agree with Google's Project Zero 90 day for everything, um, but you know that's their choice, not mine. I think that every vulnerability is different and there's a myriad of legal issues that could get you in trouble here. Um, you, know, you might have a contract uh, that uh, a EULA or a TOS or an NDA or something. Um, there's all sorts of different reasons why disclosure uh, varies so so greatly. Disclosure due, get paid. This one's easy. Uh, if the company has a bug bounty program, use it. If the company doesn't have a bug bounty program, uh, they're probably not going to pay you. Uh, and if I were you, I wouldn't demand money. Um, that could get you into the extortion realm pretty quickly, unfortunately. Bug bounty don't. Um, this is from a few years ago uh, before, no, I guess Facebook actually did have a bug bounty program at this point. Uh, so this is a, a, a vulnerability disclosure method, which I don't particularly advise. Um, this guy had tried to disclose a method uh, whereby you could post to anyone's wall on Facebook, even walls that did not allow visitor posts. Um, I guess this is still when we called it a wall, now they're a profile. Uh, and so the way that this uh, researcher decided to disclose why, was by posting on Zuck's profile. Um, that didn't go very well for him. Uh, he ended up, he didn't go to jail, he didn't, he didn't uh, lose money or anything like that. Um, but Facebook did cut him out of their bug bounty program on what would have otherwise qualified for quite a bit of money because by posting on Zuck's page, 
he violated the terms of the bug bounty program. Uh, okay, so what do you want to do after the after disclosure is done, after the vulnerability has been fixed? Uh, what do you want to do? Um, decide that before you actually start the disclosure process. Uh, disclosure when you do want to publish or present is a little bit different uh, than if you just want to get it fixed. Uh, why? Because it requires keeping the vendor in uh, in a happy place. Um, if if your only if your only goal is to get a vulnerability fixed, the the vendor doesn't have to love you at the end of the process. Um, all they have to do is is sort of you know groan and say that's a, you know okay we'll we'll fix it. But if you want to publish or present, you need to make sure that they don't just sue you at the point of disclosure, but also at the point of your publication or presentation. And so think about uh, think about that in. Uh, in your initial vulnerability report as well. Uh, you know, here's some things that obviously you might want to think about. Uh, if you disclose to them, it might give them an opportunity to fix the vulnerability, but it might also give them the opportunity to try and stop your presentation or publication. Uh, so, um, if this isn't a vuln that a vendor will be able to patch at all, um, then there is no opportunity to fix it. There is only an opportunity uh, to get them extremely pissed off at you before publication. Um, how much attention is too much? Uh, this is very important. Uh, free subway rides for life. If anyone was at DEF CON, what was this, DEF CON 16 or DEF CON 17, quite a while ago at this point, there was a talk, uh, or at least there was supposed to be a talk from a bunch of MIT kids, and the talk was titled Free Subway Rides for Life. Uh, they titled that to get exposure, to get press. It's a splashy title. Um, and it was so splashy that the MTBA, the Boston uh, Metro, sued them uh, because their talk was... Uh, going to disclose a vulnerability in the fare card system of the Boston T, the Boston subway. Uh, Boston uh, believed incorrectly that their research was a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, and sought a late Friday night temporary restraining order from a state judge in Boston to restrain the students from giving their talk in Las Vegas. Um, we at EFF represented the students. We eventually won. The TRO was lifted but that was two weeks after DEF CON ended and they were not able to give their talk. Um, it's possible at least that none of that would have happened if they had had a less prov provocative title for their presentation. Um, think of how the title of the abstract will read to all of your audiences. Um, your audience isn't just the other hackers and security researchers in the room. Uh, it's also the feds in the room. It's also investors. Uh, it's also your employer. Are you really going to give step-by-step -step instructions on how to give subway, free subway rides for life? Um, the MIT kids weren't actually planning on giving instructions on how to give free subway rides for life. Um, that was a, a tease in their title. Disclosure due. Do release a proof, proof of concept, if you want, you don't have to, that's enough for someone with your level of technical ability to understand the vuln. But don't give, uh, give a proof of concept advanced enough for script kitties to take and, uh, and run and destroy the world with. Um, is, I mean, if you're, if you're, the audience that you're aiming for is script kitties, then, uh, then certainly don't um, listen to anything I have to say. If, you're, uh, if your audience is the academic crypto community, they're going to want to see pseudocode, but they don't necessarily have to see uh, a way to actually extract a public key from an, or a private key from an Amazon uh, installation. Yeah, don't release a proof of concept that the kitties can run with. Uh, there's better ways of advancing the state of the art. That doesn't help anybody. There's resources available, uh, EFF.org slash coders, info at EFF.org. 
um, Haley's full-time job, Haley Peterson, our, our wonderful intake coordinator, her full-time job is to read and answer email from info at EFF.org. Uh, and she sends a lot of them to me because a lot of them are, are hackers just like you. And that's all I have. Uh, I think I'm five minutes short of where I was supposed to be. So if we have five minutes of questions, that'd be great. All right, thanks so much for that, Nate. This is, uh, this is Casey jumping on at the tail end there. Uh, we're just gonna look through the questions that have come in uh, and see if there's any uh, that have, uh, you know, this, this is a great uh, exposition. I think, you know, the way that you walk through, you know, the different issues, the different things for people to consider, um, you know, especially with newcomers joining into the bounty hunting space and, and people that don't necessarily have the, the context of people that have been involved in vulnerability disclosure for many years. This is very, very helpful as an overview. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, my pleasure. See what we've got by way of questions. One, one question I had for you is, you know, just in terms of um, <clears throat> the, the kinds of cases you end up getting involved in most frequently that have to do with vulnerability research. You know, what's, what's, if there was one single biggest mistake that you could say that was made that, that precipitates more of those, uh, of those representations than others, what would that be in your mind? Um, it would be a researcher using um, what they think is strong language and what the company thinks is threatening language in a vulnerable report. That's that's really the number one. Uh, we see it. We see it all too often. We see, hey, here's this vuln. It's really stupid. Uh, if you don't fix it, I'll tell Brian Krebs and your stock will lose half of its market value. Um, so basically, basically coming in too hot. Coming in too hot is, is definitely the, the biggest problem that, that we encounter. Um, the other, the other biggie, um, is getting in trouble from your employer. It's like if, if you're, if, if you do InfoSec for a living, uh, and you piss off one of your employer's, uh, clients, your employer is not going to be happy with you. So that's, an, that's another big one. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I was interested to see, uh, and this has definitely been our experience, you know, your, your call out to English as a second language as a, as a factor there. Yeah, the, yeah. The, idea, the idea that people that don't speak English as a first language, it's not necessarily a function of, of how they operate or how they think or how they behave. It's just the language difference that can actually cause their communication to come across more Absolutely. Uh, oh, and here's, here's a good one that, that I think you'll appreciate, Casey. Um, at least once a year, we deal with someone trying to report the exact same vulnerability, which is hospitals putting PII on the pager network. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hospitals do this all the time. Hospitals all over the world do it all the time. The problem is in the United States, the Wiretap Act has a specific provision making it illegal to sniff the pager network. Um, so there is literally no way of disclosing that vulnerability without also disclosing the fact that you committed a felony. Yeah, wow. That's, uh, <laughs> that one gets complicated very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> you know, one, one other question that, uh, that's floating around in here right now, we've actually got a, a viewing party going on in the office and, and this came up as we we're going. Um, just, you know, with some of the stuff that we were talking about earlier on in the day around, you know, standardization, like safe harbor, you know, different things that can be done at the program owner level to, to create, you know, a, a greater sense of bilateral safety uh, between the hackers and the program owners. I mean, obviously, you've, you've uh, seen some of that stuff and, and we've had a couple of chats about it along the way. But I'm, I'm interested to understand what your thoughts are on how, you know, these, these kind of anti-hacking laws um, which were created really before the concept of a good faith hacker. Um, how you expect to see those change over the next period of time? Oh man, um, I, know, but, I, know, I, know I know that's a deep rabbit hole, but I was that's that's the sixty four thousand dollar question. Um, yeah. You know, for the first time ever, people are talking seriously about putting a security research exemption into the anti hacking laws. Um, I. We, we at EFF have always thought that that's a good idea in principle, but we would like to, we will reserve judgment before actually seeing what that exemption would look like. Um, sure. There are folks who have started to, to get exemption, to, to get statutory language that looked even closer to something that we might like. Um, 
And as countries around the world start to adopt anti-hacking laws for the first time, we're leaning on them to include a security research exemption or a good faith security research exemption um, right. in their laws. So that's one. Uh, the, the Department of Justice here in the US is pushing on botnets real hard. They got uh, a rule change uh, early last year, late the year before, um, to give them slightly more power around botnets, but they, they want more. Um, yeah. and so making sure that when those statutory changes go into effect that they don't have um, unintended consequences is, is something that we're looking at. Yeah, okay, that's, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I mean, <clears throat> the feedback that we've gotten is, is similar, like the, the level of interest and the level of awareness of the problem amongst legislators, both, both here in the US and abroad is, is steadily rising. Um, but you know, this question of like, what the hell do we do instead? As well as I think the priority with all the other things going on in the world right now is, is making it interesting from a timeline standpoint. Yeah, indeed. Um, you know, one thing which we have to worry about in the US is uh, export controls. There's a, a multilateral export control regime called the Vosnar Arrangement um, that the US has not incorporated the most recent changes. Uh, so that, that will happen at some point. Um, and the intrusion software is included within that. Uh, and so making sure that the US doesn't screw up the whole pen testing industry uh, is gonna be key. Well, which will be an interesting challenge. So one last question real quick before we wrap up here, um, deriving from what someone's just said in the chat. Uh, just talking about the idea of, of research performed in context or, or even you know, as a moonlighting thing or a personal hobby um, of, of, of employment. You know, something that we have we have seen there was an example just given in, in the chat um, we've actually seen this I mean even internally with bug crowd employees that came in from different companies with this idea of research being perf performed at the same time as working in a security role uh, or, or you know any of those sorts of things where you know a disclosure might potentially be construed as as competitive or even you know kind of damaging to the overall mission of the company that the researchers employed by um, how, how does uh, you know what what do you suggest in terms of you know people that are that are feeling uncomfortable about that how to actually resolve that and get some more comfort around what they should do going forward um, surprise is your enemy here you don't want your manager to be surprised so making sure your manager knows what you're doing um, I think is key if your manager knows what you're doing and your manager is okay with it that's all it takes to, to CYA at least in my book um, I understand that you might not be particularly comfortable telling your manager about the, the research that you're doing on the side. <clears throat> but uh, if, if you want to, um, the, the best way of keeping your job is to make sure that, that your manager actually knows uh, what you're doing. Yeah, that's good advice. All right, well, thank you so much, Nate. This is a, this is a, a really critical issue, as I said before, and it's, um, it's great to have you unpack it the way that you have. Um, I expect we'll be talking more about this throughout the course of 2019, some of the stuff that we want to see improved out there as, as you know, EFF does as well and always has. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thanks a lot, Casey. Take care. Cheers.